So tell me about uh, Katie when you were eight years old. What was the thing like? Um, I was independent, I'd say. Uh, sporty, definitely. Uh, pretty happy and uh, stubborn. But I suppose I was probably nice as well. Yeah. <laughs> that to me, I was saying. Uh, what kind of things were you interested in or what were you doing when you were a kid? I uh, was big into an age, I suppose. Would have been maybe GAA and Kamobi and horse riding as well. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time as well, when I was eight, I was probably in and out of hospital a little bit as well. Um, so I was kind of juggling on about mm -hmm. things. But yeah, so score advice, those have been my, my what's trucks. And talk to us a little bit about that. So you mentioned being in hospital, like what, what was kind of going on at that time? So around that time, I was having um, an Ilizaria frame, which is kind of like, I, I, you've probably seen the ad of the car crash where the person has the metal frame mm -hmm. in their leg. So it's one of those frames and basically it was changed to shape my foot. So I was going over and back to England um, every week and I'd had surgery over there and um, it was just kind of for checkups going up mm -hmm. over and back with that. So they basically changed the shape of my foot and the way I walked my foot. So that was kind of what was going on around that time. So I was in and out of wheelchairs and in and out of crutches. But um, yeah, it was a really successful surgery and after that I was, I was buying it. So I could give it two years later I was um, on the, with our soccer teams, few soccer team, mainly all around and so I was helping up team rising ball so uh, yeah it was very successful and so yeah and you mentioned that you were sporty like were there other things that you're interested in outside of sports or definitely yeah I uh, have friends I suppose hanging out with friends having practice with them and um, I suppose reading wasn't really ending but it's something I did but I, mean, I think it was more active like being outside being outdoors meeting up with friends hanging out with trees basically <laughs> anything just get up, up to mischief out the back garden my my best friend was Harry my neighbour and we just go off for the day Gallivanting, so yeah, yeah. And tell me a bit about the sports that you're doing. So you mentioned that you're playing football, you're horse riding, like, sounds like you're doing maths sports anyway. <laughs> My poor parents, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. so I did nothing like camogie, soccer, and um, GAA, I suppose, like uh, football, I all would be with school. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just be on school teams and like absolutely loved them. Um, off, I would have found myself in goal, so obviously, because I wasn't the best runner, but. Um, I was. I love being the goalie, and um, like nothing would have known else who wants to be a goal. So, <laughs> um, but yeah. So I would have played those well at school, and um, then outside school with horse riding, I think was my big one. Also, put my hands gymnastics, steel chair basketball, um, basically anything that was around. I tried, and mm -hmm. yeah, would have would have done a bit with. And then I suppose didn't really even know what rowing was until I was sixteen. Um, and I went up to a sports day in UCD and it's a talent ID day. Mm -hmm. I went up to look at horse riding but actually ended up then trying out the rowing and they asked me back to training camp and fell in love with sport then. That was it really. And you mentioned the wheelchair basketball there. What was that like? Yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Such crack. Yeah. I highly recommend it to anyone actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any really good sport. Um, like all, everyone can play it. So, and it's like, it's, yeah, if you like it and be physical, it's such a good part to play. I was going to say, it looks like it's really competitive. And like, yeah. I don't know, it would terrify me playing a bit of chaotic. Like, yeah, there's a lot of just like falling into people, which yeah. I don't play. <laughs> um, so like, I wasn't really, I wasn't scoring anything. I was more just going around like pegging in people, but they knew that too. So yeah, yeah it's very tour. Yeah. And so you were, you were horse riding and then you came away and, and started rowing. So talk to us a bit about like how, like, what it felt like to start rowing like do you remember the first time getting into a boat and all that kind of that kind of thing yeah i do i remember the first time i got on the rowing machine um and the guy who was like kind of testing us at the time he was like do that again and then i pulled more like do that again because i would have had quite a good strong body just from being in the chair being on crutches and stuff i suppose i would have had stronger upper body than a majority of girls in my age so i think he was impressed by that i didn't be impressed by that made me kind of be like oh I like this like you know so I remember that and then I remember getting into the boat and just it was so freeing as well and like you know obviously for me it was the first one of the first times I had kind of done a para sport and not be doing an able-bodied sport where so I was to, at no disadvantage so like I and I actually was probably the best that was there on the day of, of the kind of training the training camp so like for me to be excelling at a sport where I wasn't at a disadvantage was an unbelievable feeling. Um, same thing happened to when I went to my first international competition and I could see all these other para athletes and all like I was like it, having a disability was no longer something like oh poor disability. It was like it's cool to have a disability and like there's so many people here and it, like I was I was so proud to be wearing my splint and proud to have a limp mm -hmm. and it was kind of the first time I'd experienced that. So yeah, I suppose. 
um, there's a few first moments of things that like that property was rolling the bag are, are really special. And you mentioned that you're independent and I obviously know you as an adult and, and I would say that you, you come across quite confident and, and I'd say relatively sure of yourself anyway. But when you were, like you mentioned, being involved in able body sports and, uh, and that kind of thing, like, and then going to play fire sport, like, what was it like? Like, did you notice when you were playing different sports as a kid that um, it might have been a little bit tougher for you? Or how, like, how did you kind of feel about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, and like, I always say, like, I never had any issues. As mm-hmm. I was never bullied. I had a great time. Absolutely loved it. But there was times where I was just more, because I am so independent, I was frustrated with yeah. myself and with my leg. And like, because I... I had all the upper bodies like I I was really good at like say jabbing the ball and cooking it out absolutely no bother but like and I could see the ball and I'd, I'd want to run at it and get it but I, I just wasn't fast enough to get there and so there was times of frustration or sitting on the sideline in my wheelchair and like raging I couldn't play like the other game that they were all playing so it's times like that that were tough like but again I suppose all character building and like that then when I started doing para sports and not only do her sports, but excelling at mm-hmm. and sport of feeling like I was an, on an even playing field. Mm-hmm. It just was, it was amazing. It was brilliant because I, I'd know no different. I didn't really yeah. know par sports around there. So, and then when I started doing it, it was just in staff. Yeah. Going in and, and a superstar straight off the bat. <laughs> not that it's not quite, but like just, you know, just being able to actually not be at a disadvantage was a whole new way. Yeah. You know, yeah. And um, you're a competitive person. So it must have been tough, kind of, like you're saying, sitting on the sideline sometimes and maybe not to give it 100% and, and then to bit like the, the kind of first time that you raced a boat and, and were, were involved in Paris sport. Yeah, sitting on the sideline was tough sometimes but again I'm just kind of lucky with people around me that tried to include me as much as they could. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like there was, I I do have like the one or two moments where I can really vividly remember being quite frustrated with the whole situation and just really looking forward to the future of being out of my chair and just like kind of wishing that for, for that to come. Hey, and are you in the chair? Uh, about two years I was in the fair and I suppose it was, it was a funny one because like being in a chair is difficult enough but going from not being in a chair and then being in a chair, you know, it, it, it is hard because you know you're so used to, I was always active, even though I was slow I was always running and even though like I wasn't the best at soccer or hurling because I wasn't able to run, I was still always doing them and I loved it so um, for that to be taken away from me was, was tough. But um, I knew this was only a means to an end and that someday I'll be back playing with them. And I, and I got thing with this group. So, um, and then, yeah, this was my first race. My first big international race uh, was Henley. And I was so nervous because I'd never added, well, in Ireland, rowing is a minority sport and then power rowing is even more of a minority sport. So I don't really have anyone to race here. And so it was my first time racing other para athletes who were the same classification of, as me. Um, so I was really, really nervous. I like I didn't sleep at all the night before the race. Um, which yeah, went went through you and just that feeling of of competing and you know being alongside someone and like just yeah, it was a thing. Like you know, it was just amazing. Yeah, it was unbelievable. You said that para rowing is small in Ireland, and then obviously you're from Galway, so it, it's it's spread around the country. So what was the kind of setup for you when you were training with rowing? Like for, like who were you kind of training with? Was it more? Uh, one to one with the coach, or were there other athletes to kind of be involved with as well? Yeah, so when I started, um, it was kind of there was there was a group that was asked back in the town of Hadidi, so we all went to the training hub before, and we all went back to our respective counties after that. We kind of just told us to join a club and kind of get going with it. So there was another guy, Keep, who was from Galway, so we did a bit of training together, but a lot of it was just myself in the single mm-hmm. um, up and down the river, and then Keith, after about six months, he kind of he left it and I, and I stayed going so um, yeah a lot of it was just in the single and then I'd I'd break coaches here to go up and down with me every weekend and then it was just a lot of erg and things and, and I suppose I wasn't doing it as intensely for the first few years really because I was only 16 when I started and had other things going on so um, I wasn't doing it as intensely as I am now um, but there was, I suppose it was really just coaches that kind of kept me going here and then I would try and join in with um, other groups as much as I can, even still here like in Galway Road Club, like if, if the junior 60s are going up I'll go up with them or if the masters are going up I'll go up with them and like especially if there's someone in the single and mm-hmm. I'll try my best to chase them down and um, so yeah like I kind of just joined in wherever I could um, and that's how I worked it yeah. So that was obviously the the start of the journey and we're talking to you now and you are a world champion this year. So what was that like? It's an unbelievable achievement for you and to go from that 16 year old night and to get that result, what, to, what was this year like? 
And um, this was like a season of dreams for me, like, because there's your, you, you dream with these moments that you want to happen and you literally daydream about them. Um, and like this summer, a lot of them came through for me. Like, so I set the world record. I got my gold medal um, at, at the world champs. And like, those are just moments that I've literally been daydreaming about for a long time. So it was, I can't really put it into words what this, what this like summer meant to me and all of those achievements went to me. So uh, just unbelievably happy, yeah. Yeah. And you've taken, you you were involved at 16 and for a couple of years that you took a little bit of time off the sport, you came back to the sport again. And like you're really giving it 100% at the moment. I know you've been working and then you've stepped back from work as well. So 2024 is a huge goal for you with the Paralympics. Yeah, massive. Yeah. So I did take about three years off. So from the age of like 18 to kind of 21, went to college. And again, I didn't have a, a rowing partner at the time. So I could only compete in the single and the single wasn't a class of the worlds at the time. So I really had nowhere else to go with it. And also wanted to have fun in college. So <laughs> um, I had my few years break. And then in third year college, I heard the single was back at the World Championships. So I decided I'd go for it again. And I've had to be training ever since then. And then once I got my bronze medal in 2019, that kind of spurred me on. So I worked for a year um, when I finished college, but then I kind of got my rowing partner, Stephen McGowan. And when I knew then that the double was a chance and I had a chance of actually competing at the Paralympic Games in 2024, I left my job as well. And we kind of both of us left our jobs and moved down to court. So we're kind of giving it our all now and just totally focusing on probably find the boat 12 months time from that. So. And what is the kind of setup and the regime like for you guys now? Like you're, if you're fully committed to rowing, like you mentioned you sometimes based in Galway, sometimes based in Cork. So what does what does the year look like and what does a week look like? <laughs> so a week looks like basically twice a day or three times sometimes a day training, mix of rowing on the water, on the machines and then weeks. Um, and the year just looks like a heavy winter trade and I suppose probably with the two of us we'll head down to Cork again um, and then coming up to summer just building again, doing the World Cups and uh, building up to the, to the World Championships and in, in, I think it's August to September of next year. And with Stephen, he was new to the sport only not so long ago. What kind of dream has it been like for him? And then, you know, you've obviously got a couple of years experience in the sport. You're teaching him a lot. You guys are working together. Like, what has that whole journey been like for the last year, year and a half? It's been amazing to watch Stephen grow. Like, he's come on and like as stubborn and as independent as, as I am, he's even more so, which is great. And it works for the sport. Like, so, um, like, he's just every, he doesn't improve. He's improving all the time. And for someone to go from being a novice rower, as it literally started rowing 18 months ago, to then go to a world championships 18 months later and like come away in fifth place is unbelievable like that's a part of the qualification spot so like I have to commend him in the work he's put in at the talent that he has to 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 bring that kind of a result so yeah it's really exciting and really positive for what we can do in the future as well. And for you like trying to work with somebody that is novice is there ever any time that you kind of find it difficult or are you very balanced and able to kind of look at the at the long game because I know like I know you spend time with the same goals on that as well, so you're not always necessarily in the double together. But yes. um, kind of be tough, like waiting, waiting for him to pick things up, or you're just so driven for for competing internationally. Yeah, it's funny. Like it's because I've my got my eyes set on Paris 2024. Like I don't I like I, the fact that Steve is a novice. It's like it's it's I spent so many like literally if you think I started rowing when I was 16 so that's 10 years ago so I spent so many years waiting for someone to begin so I, I don't find it frustrating and I suppose maybe partly to play in that is that I do have the single and I have been able to work away on that as well um, and looking like that all that all went to plan this summer so I suppose that kind of took that aspect out of it for me too uh, so yeah no it's it just be it's been great it's been great yeah it's good that you've been able to race both like it's uh, and like I know you're such an inspiration for him like you're achieving like so much in the single and then you guys are coming together in the double and and like really having a good go with it and, and progressing every time to race like it's it's getting more and more competitive and um, so it must be nice to have the opportunity to see both definitely yeah and like now that I've kind of done what I want to do in single I can as well park that now for a while and give everything to the, to the double because I suppose like even if it's only one percent, I've still spread myself a bit thin by trying to do two events at one regatta. So in some ways, it's nice now for Stephen as well to know that I'm my best going into a race. So I guess this year it's going to be great to just really focus on one thing and see where what we can do. And another year's training for Stephen, like it's going to bring him on so much more. Like, you know, his his um like curve of improvement is still like you know very steep. So yeah. 
Who was your biggest role model when you were a kid? Um, when I was a kid, my biggest role model was probably my dad. Um, and even still, he won't be. Um, I know it's not a sporting role model, but just as a person, as a whole, you know, his, his ethos and everything was great. And I really looked up to him and still do. So yeah, my dad. And then in sports, who were, who were your role models? Or who were your role models? In sports, definitely Katie Taylor would be a big one. Like I remember watching her at 2012, or Olympics, and uh, just being like amazed by her. Like she's, I love her work ethic and how she's so modest. And like, you know, I just, I think she's an unbelievable athlete. And I think everybody does. And I think she's starting to get the respect from both male and female, which is amazing, you know, and I just think she, I, I think she's class. Like she's the, She's the whole, you know, the be better, not bitter kind of a saying. Like, that is Katie Taylor. Like, she's just a savage. Um, so her, and then in my old sport, Sanita Paspori, absolute legend, again, worked so hard, has achieved so much, and is a lovely person. Did you have female sports role models when you were younger? Or, like, you mentioned Katie Taylor, like, you would have been a bit older, would she? Yeah, I would have been a little bit older then. I was trying to think, but, like, do you know, I actually probably didn't. I can think of that, like, household names when I was younger. I suppose maybe, like, um, Sonia O'Sullivan would have been mentioned a few times and maybe their reward is one. But like other than that, like, you know, actually like I'm, I'm sure like, you know, they were active or they were doing things, but I didn't know about them, you know, and I suppose that's the way it was. And what do you think of say the importance of role modeling? Like do you think it's something that is is usually important or it's it's depends on the guys and it, it changed the full direction of my life, like my like me watching the Paralympics in 2012 and watching people on the TV made me send an email, which made me go to a sports day, which made me find out about rowing. And now I don't work. I'm a full-time athlete rowing. Like it literally changed the direction of my life and it's where I, where I want, like what I'm doing. So like it's, it's it, like having role models and being seen is just, Oh, like it's, it's everything like you know it's unbelievable for yeah so it, it, it's important for girls and then it, it's important for para sport as well for people to see that there are opportunities for them for girls as a whole like they're like having the seeing girls do well at sports is going to make them want to go and do it so like it's just like me seeing the Paralympics is just an example of why you have to see it to be to be it like you know like it's just a good example but it works the very same for girls see girls have success mm -hmm. like it, it's yeah it's essential normalize it being a box yeah absolutely um we released our do it for her video there a while back um what did you feel like when you when you watched that video oh i tearing up on this it was it was so powerful you know it really struck a chord but i'd say it struck a chord with everybody you know because girls at that age is i suppose they're still in the same position that i was at that age that they didn't know you know a, they, they were, when you asked if they had role models and you know, did they, and could they mention people that you like one or two could, but a lot of them couldn't. And like, it just shows you there's still obviously a lot of not work to be done. But, um, yeah, like, I think, I think you're doing a great job of, of getting there. So, yeah, yeah, look to you in the next few years, you know, and at, do it the same cool or so, okay, it's you, will have an answer for it. Yeah, I think it's, um, it kind of demonstrates like it's still a lot of work to be done and while well, there are improvements being made, I think it's. When you talk to children and you see that they have identified um, that there's still differences and maybe less opportunity for growth at the moment, I think it really shows what's going on for people because a, a lot of people still think that, it, that it's fine and, and um, you know, there is equal opportunity for girls and boys in sport and, and, and in some places there is, but in lots of, lots of instances there, there's not. So uh, interesting to get the feedback from people to and um, to kind of see what they what they think that all speed is especially coming from such young kids to know they already feel like that it's, yes it's really hard from the heart yeah yeah it's like they you're showing that they do notice yeah. that different things are going on so when it comes to girls in sport like waters and kids that you think that we can do to to change society and um, you're like your regular person like how, how can we get there how can we change things i think a big way would probably be going into primary schools you know and like running programs of primary schools where kids are like um, shown when they, like they, they they can see what's out there for them. Again, like I didn't know what rowing was when I was in primary school, and somebody came in and showed me all the different sports, a big list of them, and then showed me the girls who would be successful at them. I'd have been much more likely to go out and go home and ask mom or dad to try try them out. So maybe maybe like 
um, you know, trying to bring things into primary schools. Because um, again, obviously kids are where we need to start with some, yeah, some, something like that. And then from a power perspective, like you had told me before that you wanted to kind of instill confidence and uh, reassure parents that there's lots of opportunities for, for children with disabilities to get out there and, and to get involved in different sports. So like, how, how can we help those parents and help those kids to, to get involved? Again, I suppose it's all about being seen and that's why at the moment, you know, I'm going to as many primary schools as I can to talk to kids because obviously, like, when you have a medal, they just sit up and listen. So I've been going to schools and, like, talked about disability and, like, it's amazing. They, I guess they're so open and, it's, you know, they love asking questions about it. And, like, it's, it's, it's not that, like, kids don't mean to be mean about things. It's more so that it's an ignorance that they just don't, like, they haven't learned about it. So, and, but they're more than happy to learn and... I guess again, maybe just it's bringing it into private schools, running programs of private schools that making kids of all abilities aware of disabilities. And um, like I suppose as well, it's not just physical disabilities, it's maybe programs that are making kids aware of, you know, things that we go on on the inside or in, you know, people in, 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 he in people's heads and stuff as well, like running little programs like that would be great. Just making awareness of, of what's available and what's out there for people. Oh, what kind of questions are you getting off for kids? Oh, hilarious. Yeah, it was brilliant. Uh, like, some of them didn't even have questions. They'd have the hand off and then they'd, like, they would come from them they'd be like, I forgot. <laughs> but, like, just really, really good questions, actually, as well. You know, like, how did you get involved? Or, like, um, what's been the hardest part of it? Or what's been the hardest part? What was the hardest part of school? What helped you in school? And, like, coming from really, really young kids, again, to so inquisitive and wanting to learn and happy to, you know, to learn. Yeah. And for you, like obviously you are, you're walking around and, and to lots of people like they may not always notice your disability. So how do you explain it to the kids? Um, well, it's, it's, well, now when I walk, I have a limp. So I usually give a bit of a demo of that and I coin to my splint as well. And I can tell them that I've had crutches and I've had wheelchairs and I've had walkers. And like, you know, you can ask them, what did, have you all seen wheelchair, wheelchair? And they'll be like, yeah. And I'll be like, well, I was in that for a little while or you know, and you just bring it back to what they know and, and again, like, you know, feel interactive with them and getting their opinion on things and, you know, asking them what they think the Paralympics is. It's brilliant, you know, like, they, and they have really good answers. Like, I ask kids that and, like, they come, they come up with brilliant stuff. So they do actually know a lot of it. It's just bringing it out with them as well. So, yes. Yeah, uh. And we talked earlier a bit about um, your full-time equipment now to rowing. Um, you are a vet by trade, you gave it a little bit of time, but quite you fully committed to be a full-time athlete. That brings its own challenges in terms of like you're, you're living in Galway, you're living here for and there's a lot of travel involved, like you're down, you know, based down in Cork sometimes, you're always traveling internationally. So talk to us a bit about instead the, you know, keep yourself going, the financial side of things. Yeah, it's tough at the moment now. Um, like I, I, I quit my job obviously in February um, and I'm not carded, so um, I've just kind of been living out savings and you know whatever I can I've, I started a sales job one made a leap as well so that kind of kept me going but yeah I have to like living in Rome obviously it helps not being rent and things but the single event doesn't actually qualify me for carding doesn't matter how well I do it but because it's non Paralympic it doesn't count for carding so which is why I suppose now that the double is up and running it's great because mm. hopefully we will start to qualify for carding and get some bit of support from sport mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to like give people the understanding of the commitment that you're making to rowing, that you're making to representing Ireland. Like, we're talking to you here, and like you are, we're a champion. And um, but it, it, it's obviously with the way that the system works, it, it's tough for you to get access to funding. So it's, it's a huge personal commitment for you, and also for Stephen at the moment. Yeah, um, Stephen left his job as well at February, and I left my job too. Like we both kind of have worked through all things mm -hmm. one day a week that we can work on. But again, it's it's literally just to keep. Mm -hmm food on the table as the man says but like um yeah it's tough it's tough but like it the commitment is worth it and I guess um like it's we deem it to be what we want to do so it's worth it's worth not having like you know a big income coming in so but uh, hopefully like if we could start doing well enough at it we will start to get mm -hmm. to get the funding but yeah it was I suppose it was from me I jumped off the cliff for you and had to hope that we land on our feet yeah, so yeah I know uh, look you're obviously lucky to have the the opportunities to be given at home and get the kind of support for your family and stuff as well. Yeah, Elman, but and probably the age that you are too, where there's there's not too many responsibilities to the best. But um, we, look, hopefully, obviously, the funding does come, come through, and, and uh, maybe some people can get in touch if they might have sponsorship opportunities. Yeah. Well, that's right, that's true. But um, no, it's a huge commitment. But like you're you're both doing so well in this board, and uh, it's great to see 
I suppose talk to us a little bit about, uh, about veterinary. The other the other half of your life, yeah. what would be what be your future at some point when you get the time? I know it's mad sometimes. I kind of forget that I am about so that. You know, because I spent so much time rowing and I haven't even looked at a cat or dog down over six months. So really it's kind of gone off my radar uh, completely. But yeah, I love it. Like obviously veterinary was my dream growing up. I always wanted to be a vet. It was always like what like what, what I deemed to do. Um, so we need to like do that and achieve that and then work as a vet was brilliant. And I did something I actually really am looking forward to getting back to. For you uh, in the sport, like what is the ultimate goal or ambition? Um, I suppose the Paralympic Games, I, I really want to medal at the Paralympic Games and it's something I've, like, since I watched the Paralympics in 2012 and saw people, like, getting their medals and standing on the podium and that moment of being like, that is, that's what I want to do, that's what I want. Since then, like, that that is still what I want, so I guess, like, hand on heart, really what I want is a, is a, is a Paralympic medal, so that's what I'm aiming for, I hope next someday they'll come. And what would you say your career highlight is so far? Um, my career highlight is probably yeah, my, my medal this summer. And I suppose it's probably just because over the last two years I haven't had to race at all. And, um, you know, it was like, it was kind of a long time coming, I think. And it was something I obviously really wanted to do, but I didn't know if I was there because I've had nothing to gain it against over the last two years. And obviously I'd be training and working hard, but that means nothing because you don't know what other people are doing. So. Yeah, it was, it was massive just to come away with that and finally get what I'd be dreaming of here. And for any girls that are thinking of dropping out of sports, like what would your advice be to them? Oh, definitely to keep going. You know, like, obviously there's a time and a place and I understand that like with leaving surgeons, you know, studies and things can sometimes get in the way. But if you can, at any way, in any way, like, you know, keep your hand in and like, there, when those times pass, when meetings are passes, get back in, get stuck in and keep going, keep, you know, keep staying involved. Even if it's not competitive, like it doesn't have to, you don't have to be going to be competitive. Like sport is just so beneficial for so many reasons. And yeah, like it's great to be competitive and, and that, but like even just staying involved with your local Kamobi team and all of that, like just, it's it's so, so important. And it's, yeah, like I've just say to just as much as you can to, to stay involved. And like you're you're an example of that where you have taken a little bit of time off to, to do other things and then come back and, and, and obviously like you're competing at, at an elite level. That's not necessarily what everybody wants to do, but it is possible. Absolutely, yeah. Like to dream big and like go after go after what you want. Like it was like when I well when I decided to go back to, to rowing, like I, I I was ten kilos heavier than I am now. I was no fitness, like when I sat back on the rowing machine, like it was like I'd never rowed before. Um so like it is possible and like I like when I was sitting on that rowing machine for the first time I was thinking of a medal and I was thinking of going to a world championship. So set your set your like you know, your targets high and like it's it's all possible.